When you get up with an expectation that God is for you, when you get up and begin to look forward at the future and quit worrying about things that you can't even do about anyway. Come on, we can't undo one minute of yesterday. It's done. It's gone. It's history. Why worry? There's no future in that. Amen. You just get dragged down. You just like walk, walk around with bricks around your feet. You know, you can't go anywhere like that. You got to realize that Almighty God is in your life. He's involved in every aspect of your life. Amen. I read this by Charles Spurgeon. I said, whoo, that's me. He said, the word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. All you have to do is what? Let the lion loose. So this morning in this house, if you with me, if we in agreement, if we can't be hindered by anything, then we're going to let the lion loose this morning. Some of you need the line loosed in your life. Woo! See, this morning, the de I can tell you the devil is grumbling and fussing. He's in a bad, he's having a bad hair day because some of you defied the odds and got up this morning even though you couldn't. You should have been thrown in a towel a long time ago. You should have just given up, got the white flag out, but you said, you know what? I'm not doing that. I'm getting up. I'm trusting that Almighty God is for me this morning. And I believe if I can just get to where His Word is. Anybody here this morning? If I can just get in His presence this morning. If I can just move in His anointing this morning, then things will get better. Amen. Let's go to that first line here. We're going to start out in Romans and we're going to then transition to the book of Esther. And we're going to get, try to help put all this together for you and I. And we know that all things, now what are all things? I don't know what your things are. Your things might be different than my thing. But I'm telling you, it don't matter what your thing is. God is working it out. Some of you are in a battle for your health. Some of you are in a battle for your finances. Some of you are in a battle for your children, your grandchildren, and loved ones who are lost and unsaved. Woo! But I'm telling you, Almighty God is not sitting up there worrying about what you and I are doing this morning. He's just examining our hearts. It says that God's eyes go to and fro in Chronicles, looking for those whose hearts are turned towards him so that he could strengthen them this morning. Do you need strength this morning? Do you need to be strengthened this morning? Almighty God is here. Amen. Work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Woo! I love that. Because it reminds me that God is always working. When you don't even realize it, come on, come on when you're getting one of them big drinks at the 7-Eleven or whatever they call them these days, God is working on your behalf. Amen. When you're driving down the street, going to your job, God is working on your behalf. Woo. When you get mad, start grumbling and complaining, think they're going your way at work, God is still working on your behalf. Amen. 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 We serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. Amen. One who works to the good all things. See, it doesn't matter what we're going through. We're going through. Amen. He didn't say God works to the good all things for those who are camped out no. in Nowheresville. In the lonely bar, if you study the Bible. In the middle of nowhere. If you camp out there, you're just going to stay there. Boy, but you got to draw some fresh anointing. Amen. you got to draw some strength from Almighty God. You can't go by, and we can't go by what we see. No, we can't. Because I'm telling you, God works in amazing ways. Yes. It astounds me how God works sometimes. 
Christ is never caught by surprise when the enemy attacks. Do you realize the enemy comes to do what? He doesn't come to bring you Christmas presents. He doesn't come to say how you do. He comes for one purpose only. What is that purpose? To kill, to steal, and destroy. Well, I'm telling you, your Redeemer lives. And he's not caught by surprise when the enemy comes against you. Hopefully I'm going to give you an example of how God works that out. Even when you don't realize when something is happening over here in your life, it's going to come to fruition later. Because Almighty God is orchestrating what is happening in your life. Amen. Amen. I know some of you are saying, Brother Charlie, how in the world can you stand up there and say that God works to the good when you don't know what I've been through? I tell you, we've been through a couple places myself. Man, I've been on the other side of Lodi Bar. I've lost people that I shouldn't have lost at too young an age. I have loved ones that are not serving God. I have loved ones that are caught up in addiction, addiction, that are struggling and fighting for their very survival. And I'm here to tell you that God is working it out. If I can't believe he's working it out to the good, then I'm whistling Dixie up here. But I stand before you today and tell you that I believe with all my heart that God is working it out. Amen. That today is just another step, another day in the process as God Amen. begins to work out. Now I can't get off of this. Amen. Glory to God. See, there's always a heavenly plan in faith. This morning, if you want a picture, all of heaven is standing in a See. He, they, we sang, we joined in with the heavenly host this morning. All of heaven is standing at attention this morning. Angels are watching us, wondering how in the world we're so connected to Almighty God and why He cares so much about us. It perplexes them, the Bible says. They watch us, they observe us, because we are God's favorite. You are God's chosen. Woo! You have to believe that God has a plan, has already a plan in place to work through what you're going through. Amen. Amen. Then we read that Christ will never leave, forsake, or abandon you. Amen. Thank God. Hallelujah. Thank God he doesn't bail out when I act like a knucklehead. Thank God he doesn't bail out when me and my wife get crossed up because she adapts and won't submit. I learned that word the other day Woo, come on now. Thank God. He's patient and kind and merciful when I act like an idiot. Oh, I'm probably the only guy in here that does that, right? I'm probably the only guy in here that pouts when the, we don't get the remote to go our way. We've got to watch buy this dress or HGTV or something. So, so my wife says, oh, you want to watch this? Oh, yeah. Hold a gun on me, please. Amen. Next one, please. First. Now, working our way towards the message this morning. Still in Romans, Romans chapter 8 is all about the spirit of the living God. It's about the Holy Spirit that lives and abides and drives and influences and shapes your life. Amen. Glory to God. So it says... What then shall we say to these things? Those things that we read about how the enemy, we know there's an enemy out there. If God, come on, somebody help me. If God, if God, who? So if God is for us, if God is for you, who can be against you? It doesn't matter what the enemy's array and forces look like. It doesn't matter how many they are. It doesn't matter what strategy they're working out. It doesn't matter what plan they put in place. I'm going to show you that. Woo! Amen. Because God is for us. And if God is for us, nothing can stand against us. So Christ, I always say this, Christ is more for you your family, your children, your grandchildren, your marriage, your job, your future, your divine purpose. He's for you. 
than you can imagine for yourself. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us to inspire us. You look, the Holy Spirit is not a critic. There's no condemnation in Christ. He is there to inspire you. That when the world says no, he says, oh yes. Take another look at this and we're going to take another run at this. Amen. He encourages you because if you can believe God for the impossible, he'll show up in a mighty way. From a heavenly perspective, no weapon in the dark kingdom can do what? Amen. Prosper or harm you. You were created by God to be victorious in this life. But you have to take a stand for who you believe in. Who do you believe in? What's his name? His name is Jesus. And not only do you have to believe in him, you got to understand what do I believe about him? Do I believe that he works to the good all things? Can I possibly get that between this thick skull that God is truly for me? He is. This morning I'm here to declare and proclaim that God is for you. The Holy Spirit is with you every step of the way. Through difficult times and through the good times. The Holy Spirit is not a bailer. He doesn't pull the ripcord every time the going gets tough. When you go in and you get the bad report, he doesn't say, oh, that's too tough for me. No. Oh, I'm out of here. No, man. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost says, we in for the long haul. I'm with you every step of the way. Don't you fear. Don't get into fear. Don't get worried. Don't start confessing things that you shouldn't be confessing over your life. Just trust in who I am. Trust in who I created you to be. Trust in what I created you to be. Woo! See, the, the problem we face, and, I, and look, we, it's, we, it's us, is that we think way too small. I mean, my vision is limited like right here. If I could see the big picture, if I could go back 20, 25 years and would have known where God was bringing me, I would have been a lot, a lot friendly than needs to get along with the God. I fought him most of the way because I had such short-sightedness. I couldn't see him working to the good all things. So when I got in those desperate places in my life, when I experienced those setbacks, I, I could have got in a pity party. I could have begun to howl, why me, God? Why me? Why not somebody else? What, you, I don't want anybody else to have to go through what I went through. Many of you don't either. Because God has equipped me to get through it. Yes. He brings me through the storm. Oh, yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So now we're going to go. You know, I'll do this every time I preach. We're going to go to the Old Testament now. Because see, the word of God is God breathed. It's good for instruction. It's good for reproof. So God is going to give us an example of how he works to the good. All things. Amen. Do you believe he works to the good all things? Amen. So if you're having a bad day, he's still in it. Come on. Amen. Come on. All right. Well, I'm going to kind of walk you through this because Esther is really an interesting book. It takes place about 2,500 years ago. It's in the kingdom of Persia, which is modern-day Iran, under King Xerxes, or Azahowers, depending on what translation you read. And it's in a kingdom where, if you remember, Nebuchadnezzar taken all the Jewish exiles and taken them to what? Babylon. In this case is Shusan or Susa. So we have here three major, or actually four major players in this story that we're fixing to read, this account. See, this is written by the Holy Ghost. Can somebody say amen? amen. See, this story of Esther was captured by the Holy Spirit. Every word was scrutinized by the Holy Ghost. Put in place. Every dot, dot, every tittle was put in place so that we could glean and learn what God is saying about the lives of these people. Yeah. Because many of our lives mirror or are a, a reflection of their life. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. So we find ourselves in this story in ancient Persia. Right. Xerxes is king. It's a pagan culture. They worship multiple gods. Right. 
And then we have the Jewish people who are being assimilated into their culture. Mordecai and Esther are happen to be two. Amen. Nehemiah, Ezra, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, all of these players were in the same condition. They were taken out of their homeland, out of their home, and moved to a foreign land. Amen. They're in somebody else's house. Doesn't look good. Doesn't look good at all. And in this story, we find out that God is going to use... See, let me make sure you understand. God doesn't kill people. <laughs> he doesn't inflict pain and torture on people. The people we read about in this story, the villains, the dark kingdom, are a result of the choices that they make in their life. See, we always have the option to choose God or choose something else. And whatever that something else brings. Amen? Right. So in this kingdom of Persia, Vashti, the current queen, they're having a great Mardi Gras festival, if you will, kind of compared to modern day time. They are partying down. All right, now. And the king, I'm going to tell you, God uses events that we, we just go, oh, there's no way. But God uses events in our life. So Xerxes and his staff, his crew, his people are partying down, having a Mardi Gras-like festival. I mean, this just party time. And he sends for his queen, Basti, if you read the story, if you've read the story. And she says, you know what, I ain't going to be part of this. She refuses to come. She had a choice to make. She chose not to go. Amen. Guess what it did to the, the king? He lost face. His queen said, ah, not going to do that. Now, what do you think happens when you do that to the king? He is not a very happy camper. Right. So he consults with his A-team, and they say, boot her out. Get rid of her. Because if, if what she does catches on, we're all in trouble. <laughs> Amen. Paraphrasing, if you will. <clears throat> and so he does that. And they decide to have a beauty contest. You know, Cheryl and Harry Salem, if you, if you don't think God can use a beauty contest, just, I mean, remember Harry and Cheryl Salem come here and minister. She, she's like 1987 beauty queen, Amen. U.S. Miss, oh, Miss America, 80, Miss America. That's right. And let me tell you, they've been preaching the gospel ever since. Amen. Thousands of lives have been changed Amen. through a beauty contest. Come on. I'm back in my story. So Xerxes gets to the council and says, listen, you got to sweep the land, find some young, good-looking woman, lady, in a contest, and we're going to make her your wife. My Lord. And we'll make her queen in place of this one that won't obey. Well. And throughout, now I'm going to tell you, Persia went from the Mediterranean Sea up to northern Turkey all the way to India. It was a big place, lots of people. And they have this beauty contest. Now comes the major players I want to just share with you for a moment. We have three things at play. We have a natural kingdom, right. Xerxes and the Medo-Persian Empire. We have the dark kingdom who wants to destroy. Do you realize the devil has been just try, trying to destroy the Jews for 5,777 years, if you haven't been counting up. And then we have the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. Right. All three of these are at play in this story, if you understand how it works. Amen. Amen? With me. So we find now in the middle of the city, in the middle of Persia, God is going to take two nobodies, yeah. two no-name people, yeah. and do something amazing with their life. Yeah. Because the enemy has set in place a plan to destroy them. Yeah. Does anybody relate to that? Has the enemy set out to destroy any of you? See, some of you are a testimony to the mercy of God because you're still standing. Amen. Everybody else wrote you off. Amen. Everybody else give up, but you're still getting up. Amen. You're still fighting. Yes. You're still trusting. Yes. Glory to God. So we see here, as the story unfolds, Esther becomes in the play right here. 
Mordecai has a cousin named Hadassah whom he had brought up because she had neither father or mother. This girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter Amen. when her father and mother died. So we have here a young girl in a foreign land of an ethnicity is not part of that culture. She is a Jew in the middle of a pagan culture. Right. She has no chance at anything other than manual labor. Her best day, her best possible outcome in this situation would be to be somebody's slave. Come on. So we have Mordecai, a Jewish man living in a culture, brought it out exile, living in a strange culture. There's no way, like Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, there's no way this man should be ever achieve anything. Come on now. Woo, we're fixing to find out some stuff. Yeah. Esther orphaned as a child, uprooted from a homeland, living in a pagan empire, empire in a totally different culture. She is like a fish out of water. Do we know how Jews live today? They, not, they haven't changed in all those thousands of years, right? They're very disciplined. Yes. They're very focused on the one true God. They're very focused on living their life with righteous and dignity. Come on now. Yes. In a place that is crazy. It's like living in New Orleans, the modern day New Orleans. Amen. <laughs> there was a struggle in their spirit. Amen. Glory to God. God bless. So we see here. Go to the next slide. And let me show you something. So Esther is taken from her home into the king's service. Amen. She's put in a 12-month program for beautification to make her presentable to the king. Let me tell you, you just don't go into the king. Come on, and you just don't walk in there. Thank God for the blood. Because we can go into the throne room of the king even without beauty treatment. Glory to God. But this culture was different. When the turn came for Esther, the girl Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihel, to go to the king, she asked for nothing more than what the person in charge told her. And Esther won what? Favor. Come on, everybody say that with me. Favor! Favor! How important is favor? Yeah. Esther won favor of everyone who saw her. Can I just tell you she was raised right? Can I tell you that she, her, her cousin Mordecai, who became her adopted father, instilled in her the value of honor, integrity, dignity, respect. Am I talking to anybody this morning? I'm telling you, favor with God and man is more valuable than wealth and position. Because with the favor of God, nothing can stop you. Favor is the exceptional kindness, mercy, and preferential treatment from God. Favor moves you from the impossible realm, like Hadassah, like Esther was. She was in the realm of impossibility. There is no way. It's humanly impossible for a Jewish girl who's been exiled to a foreign land to become queen of the Persian Empire. If you ask the statistician, it would be like 9 trillion, 999 million to one. There's no way this girl should end up where she did. But God, but God, but God's plan and purpose, he's working to the good. From the realm of the impossible to where your dreams come true. Amen. Where your hopes, your expectations begin to come to pass. That's the kind of God you serve. Yes. That's what favor will do for you. Amen? Amen? So we have the kingdom of light represented by these two people here. Who worship God, who love God, who serve God, yes. who have set their lives apart for God, who live for God. Transposed against the dark kingdom. Represented by someone else. His name was Haman. Yes. He's an Agite. Next slide, please. Uh, go, go back. Never mind. Let me, let me just tell you before you even get there. Haman is the what we call the evil guy in this story. 
But God has a way of taking unrelated events. See, we don't even see how this is happening. The second event you're going to see in this story is that now Esther is the queen. She has the favor of God, the favor of man, and the favor of the king. I, I call that a triple play. <laughs> Amen. And what we find out is that with favor, you got a lot going for you. Her uncle Mordecai, though, as a Jew, as a Jewish man, he keeps checking on his niece when you read, when you read the account of the story. And I hope I'm trying to keep it together. <clears throat> and he discovers a plot of two people who are going to try to kill the king. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah. So Mordecai is now coming to the palace to check on Esther. In one of his trips to the gate, he discovers a plot to destroy the king, to assassinate him. So we have two unrelated events. Esther comes from nowhere to be queen for such a time as this. And now Mordecai is going to be recognized. It says here during the time Mordecai was sitting outside the king's gate, he discovered these two guards are plotting to kill King Xerxes. Where does that come from? The dark kingdom. Yeah. However, Mordecai discovers it, tells Queen Esther, and Queen Esther tells the king. They investigate it, and what happens to the two criminals? They pay the penalty. They hang them. Yeah. And it says here, what's, this is important, I want you to catch this, and all this was recorded in the book of Annals in the presence of the king. Now I'm going to show you how God uses and works all things to the good for those who love him. Does he work to the good? Amen. We find here in the next chapter, let's go to the next slide. Then. <clears throat> in chapter 3, Haman comes on the scene. Haman is an Agite. If you don't remember what, what Agite is, it's an Amalekite. Remember in 1 Samuel when Saul conquered the Amalekite and he spared the cattle, the sheep, and King Agai. Agag. And Samuel comes up and says, what's this I hear? The bleeding of the sheep. What's this I hear? And Saul starts making excuses. Obedience is better than always. Well, he's a descendant of the same king. Agag. He is filled with bitterness and hatred. Amen. Amen. Is bitterness and hatred a dead end street? Oh, yeah. It'll get you nowhere. nowhere. He planned not only to kill Mordecai, but his plan was also to destroy what? All the Jews. Amen. He wasn't satisfied because let me tell you, Mordecai was a thorn in his side. Haman gets promoted to the second in charge of the kingdom. And Mordecai won't recognize him, won't bow down, won't honor him. And so we find here that Hagman is a miserable, self-centered man filled with hatred. You know anybody like that? Bitterness, anger, no peace. No matter how successful, he's the number two man in Persia, but he's not happy. Listen, you can't be happy when you're filled with that kind of junk that kind of seed. Amen. 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 So Haman is driven by the dark kingdom. The enemy sees that in him. Don't think the enemy can't see that in us. By our attitude, by the way we live, by the way we do things. The enemy will take advantage of your attitude. He'll take advantage of your bitterness. He'll take advantage of your anger. He'll take advantage of your unforgiveness. He'll use it against you and against the people. Oh my. The other thing that you want to realize is that Haman used his official position for evil and not good. Right. Because the evil empire is never out for your welfare. Amen. That's not their nature. Amen? Amen. Next one, please. Amen. Oh, wow. Right here's a good little time for me to get in my little PowerPoint. This guy is going to reap. He's going to reap. Yeah. Come on, you guys got to be with me on this. This is powerful. I know it takes a moment to get it 
built there, but I'm telling you, it's powerful for you to grasp this. Amen. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to his sin nature, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, hatred, that's your sin nature. If you sow to that, from that nature, you'll reap destruction. The one who sows to the Spirit, from the Spirit, will reap eternal life. Haman is an example of someone who let pride, arrogance, his position, come on, it's going to cost him everything. He has a choice to make. Haman could have chosen life. He could have chosen to forgive. He could have chosen to let it go. Amen. Each of us are faced with the reality of what kind of seed am I going to sow in my life? Yeah. All right now. Listen, the words you speak have meaning. Yes, they do. What you say takes root in your life. Amen. If you begin to understand how to sow good seed, how to sow blessing, how to sow expectation, how to sow hope, how to encourage other people. How to give them the hope that God placed inside of you. That's the, that's the person God is looking for. He said, choose this day, life or death. And just in case you aren't sure, choose life. And then that's his desire for us. So we see now, Haman has been promoted to the number two position. But he's, he's so bitter and so angry, he can't enjoy life. It steals his joy. It steals his teeth. Every time he sees Mordecai, the hair rises on the back of the His face gets red. It don't matter how his day is going. The moment he saw Mordecai, it just blistered him all over. Do you know anybody like that? Come on. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. I worked with some knuckleheads in my life. Every day they showed up at work, they had to complain about I'm, I'm telling you, I served with people 10, 15, 20 years. And I'm telling you, stay with people I served with, they never had a good day. Never, ever, ever one day had a good day. It was always somebody's fault. Always something wrong. Always something to complain about. God can't work through that junk. God can't work through that. He doesn't. Somebody say amen. Amen. So this guy is on a path of destruction. So I'm, let me refresh them. We have Mordecai and Esther representing the kingdom of light. Those who choose life. Yes. We have Haman of the dark kingdom who's filled with bitterness and anger and frustration. Not happy. Amen. So he makes a plot. Haman goes into the king. He makes a plot to destroy the Jew. He goes to the king. Now in the natural realm, the king has a lot on his mind. He doesn't care about the Jew. He doesn't even know who they are. Even though he's married to one. And he goes to the king. And he said, listen. I'll give you 10,000 talents of silver. Because there's the people here that just... You don't need in your kingdom. And the king said, do what you will with the people. So Haman issues an order under the king's authority to destroy the Jews. I hope you can begin to make the connection here. The enemy doesn't rest. Amen? Haman got the permission. He puts out an edict or a, a, a court order giving the permission of the people in the Persian Empire the authority on 12 months from that day that he could destroy every Jewish person, man, woman, child. And never blinked an eye. It was of his nature. And the king really didn't know about Jews. He didn't care. In the natural. But we see something working here that's really very interesting. Amen? Next slide, please. When Haman puts this order out throughout the kingdom, they're, they're, I'm telling you, it was dire straits for those people. It seemed hopeless because once the king puts out an order with his seal on it, guess what? It can't come back. You can't erase it and go, oops. Destruction is on the way. And Mordecai goes to the queen Esther, who happens to be Jewish by nature, and he said, listen, you need to go talk to the king. We are in desperate trouble here. We need, you need to move and ask the king to, to do something about this. Right. 
And Esther said, you know what? You know, I can't go in there. To go into the king's presence without him calling for you, I'd be a dead person. Right. And this is Mordecai's word that rings true today for you and I. Whatever Esther's words were to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. See, when God places a call on your life, when God calls you out, when he tells you to take a stand for what you believe in, when he can... Uh, woo! Do not think that because you're in the king's house, just because you live in the palace and hop out with the king, so don't think for a minute that you alone will escape. For if you remain silent, if you don't do something about what you know in your heart is the right thing to do, then the Jews' deliverance will come from some other place. Because God's going to deliver his people. God's going to deliver you. God's going to deliver his people. God's going to work to the good all things. But you and your father's name will, will perish. But who knows but that you have come to a royal position for just such a time as this. He makes the connection that God is working to the good. They would have no voice in the court had this not happened. There would be no Queen Esther unless God gave her divine favor. Are you connecting the dots? That's how God works in your life. We call that providence in the theological realm, where God's hand is moving your life, moving things around, shifting, putting people in your life, taking people out of your life, moving you positioned over here, then moving you over there for your good. Amen. Hester was wise. Hester was very wise. She devises two banquets that she's going to invite the king and Haman too. Because see, one thing Haman forgot. He doesn't know Esther's a Jew. Calculated mistake. That's one of the mistakes the devil makes. He doesn't know you born again. He doesn't know you're washed in the blood. He doesn't know you've been redeemed by the blood. He doesn't know who you are in Christ. Woo! Mistake number one. Amen. And God good. Next slide. Before I read that, let me just connect another dot for you. This is powerful. This is fun. Yeah. I, I, it drives me crazy. <laughs> Haman is now furious, angry, because every time he sees Mordecai, man, he just he goes to the banquet, the first banquet with, with the king, him and the, just him and the king and Esther. And man, they drink and they, they talking and they fellowship and they having a good time, man. They're just talking about all this thing. Guess, guess how God has a sense of humor. Guess who Haman sees the first thing he does when he leaves the king and Esther? Who is standing right in front of him when he walks out? Mordecai. He's high. He's joyous. Haman is going, well, man, I had lunch with the king. Man, I had a business lunch with the queen. Things are looking good. And he walks out and he goes, oh, my God. Not him again. Is there any peace? And he's mad. He goes home and he tells his wife, he said, you know, I'm a blessed man. I'm number two in the kingdom. I got money to burn. I got cars in the garage, bass boat. I'm just paraphrasing. <laughs> he said, I've got everything. I've got power. I've got position. I've got finances. I've got houses. I've got land. But I've got no peace. Mm. And the wife and the friends say, build the gallows. Since you have favor with the king, build the gallows. 75 feet high. Now that's twice as high as this room, by the way. Wow. And next time, when you go to the next banquet with the king, just whisper in his ear, you got favor, man. Yes. Say, I wanna, I'm going to hang Haman. I'm going to hang Mordecai on this. Haman's going to hang Mordecai on this gallows. Right. Haman said, that's a great idea. So he has his people begin to build a gallows for Mordecai. Got a little brass plaque on there, built just for Mardi Gras. 
It's coming. My day is coming. Count you, man, look, countdown is on. It's hopeless. Mordecai, your days are over. You're done. You're toast. I won't have to deal with you anymore after tomorrow morning. You are done. Boy, God's got a sense of humor, though. Oh, he do. The same night they build in the gallows. <laughs> and you ain't ready for this. <laughs> Y'all way too still for me. I know you're not ready for this. The same night he's building the gallows for Mordecai. The night the king couldn't sleep. Nothing's by accident. You, you think the king was restless for a purpose. You think God made him restless. He couldn't sleep. He had a lot on his mind. So he called his main men in there and said, listen, you need to read some stuff to me so I can get sleepy. And they got this big old book like this and they dragged that book in because it's, it's the list of all the accomplishments of his kingdom. And they flip open the book and guess what page they turn to? Guess what page showed up? Guess who showed up? That night the king could not sleep so he ordered the book of Chronicles, the record of his reign to be brought in and read to him. And it was found recorded that Mordecai, the aggravator, Mordecai, the thorn in Haman's side, <laughs> woo, had exposed Bikna and Teresh, two of the king officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate the king. And the king said, just by happen chance, it was just, who knows how this happened. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this, the king asked. Nothing has been done, they answered. Guess what the king said? Woo! It's fixing to get good. Look, I love ugly sometimes. It's fixing to get ugly. He said, how come anything been done for Naaman, for, for Mordecai? This man saved my life. He said, who's in the court? Hey, but it's standing outside his door. Yeah. By accident. Oh, yeah. Per chance. Such a time as that. Are y'all with me this morning? Yeah. Do you see God working yeah. behind the scenes? Yeah. They open to the right page. Uh -huh. Haman shows up at the right time uh -huh. and he says, send him in. Woo. Now you know the per Haman's personality, right? It's all about him. Right. So the king says, what would you do to a, for a man that the king would want to honor? And the Bible records that Haman said, he's got to be talking about me. I'm going to say stupid is the stupid does. He doesn't even know that God's got his number. Adjusting him crosshairs on him. <laughs> suddenly. Suddenly. Yes. Suddenly. Yes. Come on, guys. Xerxes the king looks at Haman and says, What would we do for such a man as this? And Haman said, Well, you know, since it's me thinking to himself, right, right. I would get a royal robe the king has worn. Oh. Woo! You're wait a minute. I'll take the pass out. <laughs> this stuff is good, man. This stuff is good. I'll tell you, this is good for your soul. This is good for your heart. This is good for your attitude. This is good for your life. Because God is working to the good. All things. Amen going, whoo, I'm looking good too. I'd get a nice fine robe and put it on me. Whoo, I'd put a crown on him. I'd get one of the king's finest horses. And I put that man right there. Yeah. I would, oh, I would look good on that horse. Yeah. <laughs> and then I would take him all through the town and say, this is what happens to the man that honors the king. Yeah. 
And 13 said words that are profound even today. Huh. Yes. Stunned. Huh. Haman. Uh -huh. I'll see if I can get the look. <laughs> he said, go and do just what you... <laughs> go and do just what you said. For who? For Mordecai. Do you think for one minute the devil knew he was stepping into that trap? No. The devil set this man up for a chunk. Oh, glory to God. Of course, Haman was filled with joy. He was all excited about the proposition of leading his arch enemy who he just built the gallows to hang on to take him around the city and recognize him. Ooh, glory. My God. Can somebody say, my God? Ooh, woo. Man, I got to get down here. This is what the anointing is right here. Haman gets the horse, he gets the robes. He helps Mordecai get dressed like this. He helps him on the horse. He looks at Mordecai. And Mordecai looks down and says, man, I don't know how this happened. What? I mean, look, he's in shock. What am I doing here? I'm, on, I'm wearing the king's robe. I got a crown on my head. I am a Jew in the middle of nowhere, a no name, nobody, and I'm fixing to ride the king's heart downtown to the capital. Haman takes that horse. Man, you had to prod him with a cattle prod. This is what's done to the man who favors the king. There you go. Everybody look. Yeah, that's right. That's Mordecai. Yeah, look at it good. Yeah, that's him. This is me. I'm leading him around. Yeah, I am, I am a knucklehead. Yes, indeed. And he's leading him through the city. Yep, yep. Come on, the God will make a donkey out of your enemies. He gets to the end. You know, it, did, it, it took a while to do that, right? This wasn't just a two-minute ride no. to get off the carousel. No. You know, you need to put the coin in and just go around a couple of times. Mm -hmm. This was all day. All day. This man, was, was, his feet was blistered. His ego was sore. Yeah. His pride was busted. Yeah. His mind is going crazy. Yeah. How did I end up yeah. leading this guy around? My arch enemy, I am the number two man in the kingdom. But God. But God. But God. But God. But God. Mm. I hope you get that picture of how the enemy is going to face you. Because there's coming a day. There's coming a time. There's coming an hour. There's coming a minute. There's coming a moment in time when your enemy will be under your feet. Listen, I type in shadow, I can tell you right now, Mordecai is on top of the world. Because he realizes that God has something great in store for him. That God is working to the good, all things. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Next slide. God bless your home. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, when Haman got back to the stable... <laughs> Ooh, he was not a happy camper. Oh, he really was. He didn't like doing God's dirty work. Come on, God put the hammer on him, man. Amen. But Haman, as he finished honoring Mordecai, as he walked miles and miles honoring this Jew, his arch enemy, he rushes home with his head covered in grief. I would say shame. And told Jerez and his wife and all his friends, the same one that told him to build a gallows, what he just did. And this, this is another profound statement. Look, you, if you glean from this, I'm telling you, it's astounding. His advisors and his wife said to him, are you ready for this? 
This didn't come from out of nowhere. Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started. Wait a minute, where did that come from? I, I don't understand this. Zeresh, you're his wife. You're for him. But you're telling him that since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand. You will surely come to. Your enemy will surely. Your enemies will surely. Your enemies will surely. That's God's word for you. Did you capture that? Where do you think his wife got that information? She didn't say, man, what's the matter? Why is, what, what's, no, she said, listen, man, your downfall has started. If you let this guy, if he rode the king's heart, you were on a downward slide. You've made some very bad choices in your life. You need to, oh my God. Just about the time they finished telling him what's going to happen, his family, his good friends, prophesying that he's fixed to come to ruin. They come get him to go to the next banquet. The ultimate finale banquet. The in your face banquet. Next line. Haman shows up. He's depressed. He's discouraged. And he doesn't know but the double barrel is fixing to drop on him. He's sitting with Esther. He's sitting with the king. And the king tells Esther one more time. What is it do you want up to half the kingdom? And she said, you know what, King? I'm going to paraphrase because it's easy. We're out of time. She said, if it were a trivial matter, I wouldn't even bother you. But there is an edict that's been issued that my life and the life of my people are going to be destroyed. And I need you to change that. And the king said, who in the world would threaten the life of the queen? And she said, that man, that vile man, Haman, has conspired to destroy me and my people. And we know already, Thirdly is impetuous. It says he jumped up. He was so filled with anger and rage that he walked off. And Haman jumps out of his chair and leaps towards the queen after to beg for his life because he knew already his fate was sealed. The king comes back. Haman's falling all over the queen. He said, would you molest the queen in my presence? In my house? My lord. And here's what's really astounding. I don't know. Y'all think the whole book is not right? If I do. One of them says, listen, there's a gallows. <laughs> Woo! So there's a gallows that Haman just had built 75 feet high for Mordecai. And the king said, hang him. See, what he went for evil, God turned it in his own head. Come on. And of course, the rest of the story is that the king issued another order that allowed the Jews to defend themselves and, and save the remnant people of Israel so that we still have a nation today. See, what God is always working to the good. This is the type of shadow of how God works often in our life. That we don't see in a job when God moves a certain thing around. Or we don't see when God something happens over here. But when you begin to look at the big picture and make the connection of what God is doing, you begin to see that deliverance is on the way. That help is on the way. That God is working to the good. All things for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen. Next slide. Another one of the profound moments. At the end of the book, the last verse that you read, it says Mordecai the Jew right. is now second in rank. Oh, 
preeminent among the Jews and held in high esteem by many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of the oh my God what kind of character is God looking for in you and I do you want God working for the good of all things in your life there's a way to do that we have to just like these Old Testament people under the Old Covenant, I'm telling you, we have to understand how God works. Yeah. He can't work through hatred. On, he can't work through bitterness. He, he can't work through discouragement. He can't work through people who are speaking things over their life of, of discouragement and despair. God can only work through His Word. Amen. We need to loose the lion in this house Amen. and let His Word speak for itself. Mordecai used his position and influence for the good of the people. That's what God wants you and I to do. Amen. To use where he positioned. No matter when your job, it doesn't matter. In your family, wherever you are, he wants to use your position as a mother, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather. It doesn't matter positionally. He wants to use it for the good of the people. Amen. You and I are ambassadors of life for the kingdom of life. Mordecai's character of honor, fidelity, and integrity positioned him for divine purpose and destiny that God had for him. See, your character has to match the destiny God has for you. If God has destiny in your destiny, greatness, positionally, I mean greatness as a husband, greatness as a father, greatness as a grandfather, you have to position yourself for that. Your character has to match those positions. You have to walk in honor and integrity. You have to walk in righteousness. You have to live a God kind of life. Amen. Next slide, please. We'll wrap this up and then I'll give a quick testimony here. Paul, I think, was looking back at many of these circumstances I just shared with you in Romans chapter 8. And he says, Nay, in all these things you and I go through, in all the challenges that we face, all the times we're discouraged, all the times we're disappointed, all the times that things don't go our way. Right. We just went through the flood, many of us, many of you. Amen. Your home's flooded, your business is flooded. But God was with you and he worked to the good all things. Right. He sent people in our life at the right moment, at the right time to help us put our lives back together because that's how God works. Amen. He said, nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. Are there any conquerors in here this morning? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor power, yes. woo, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other creature shall be able to what? Separate. From the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The whole message through Esther, the whole message through Romans 8 is that God loves you. God is for you. And he is working to the good all things. Amen. Because that's the kind of God we serve. What a mighty God. I'll give you a quick testimony. Can I do that? Amen. And wrap it up. A good friend of mine asked me last night what I was preaching on today. And I preached a sermon. <laughs> I don't know if he was ready or not, but he got it. <clears throat> but I, I knew this couple. And uh, on Hooper Road, they had had an accident, and they ran into the back of a vehicle. And it hit another vehicle, and it hit another vehicle, and it hit another vehicle. <clears throat> and they were at fault. So when the police come, you know, this couple said, listen, we're, it's our responsibility. I, I didn't stop in time. So the next two vehicles said, fine, their insurance company dealt with it. But the lead vehicle was a young man in his 30s. Had a couple of kids. Lived on Blackwater, I think it was. He did. And he got out of his car. And he said, oh, man. And he went back and they said, oh man, we're so sorry. He said, you don't have to worry about it. He said, I'm going to sue you. Oh, this couple was elderly, by the way. 
He said, I'm going to get your house. Haman. I'm going to get your car. I'm going to get your retirement. I'm going to strip you clean and pick your bone. Famous words. This cloud hung over this couple for several years because this litigation is not very easy when you have multiple vehicles. <clears throat> and all this time, this heaviness, this cloud of impending destruction hung over this couple. But they continued to serve God, come to church, worship God, believe God, speak life, speak scriptures over their situation, over their circumstance, trusting in God because they used that scripture right there. That's what they stood on. That even in this mess, that even if it's my fault, that God is going to work this to the good. My Lord. About two years into the litigation process, they worked at a, another food bank in this area. And they, they pray for people, they lay hands on people, they pray in tongues. And a lady, an elderly lady came and stood before them said, I need prayer for my family, my son, my grandchildren. And they said, well, yes, man, what's your name? And when they got the lady's name, it was the mother of the boy who sued him. Challenge! Are you kidding me, God? Can you be serious? You want me to pray for this woman and her son and his family? As they related the story. But you know God is good. And they never shared any of this with the lady. And they prayed for her and they laid hands on her. and Prayed that God would bless her and her family. But the young man had already set in place a course of destruction in his life. You notice Haman kept setting that course of destruction through bitterness and hatred and anger. The insurance company comes back to this couple and said, listen, this guy's got four of the lawsuits. This may take longer than we think. But God. Now I'm going to tell you, God doesn't do things to people. He allows people to make choices that lead to destruction. Right. The young man made some very bad choices after that. The insurance company comes to this young couple and said, listen, the young man that's suing you is actually going to have to sue you from Angola. This bitterness, this anger, this rage has cost him and caused him to, you know, go beyond the boundaries. And he ended up in prison. And within three months, he died. He passed away in prison. To the choice of the, remember, I'm not implying any way whatsoever that, that it was God. But God gave this man enough chances, even right. through his own mother, to change his heart, to change his attitude. Yeah. And suddenly, well, wake up over there. <laughs> suddenly the cloud, the burden lifted. Yeah. Because there's no longer an opportunity. There was no threat anymore over their life. <laughs> So they now get to live out the rest of their life in peace and joy. Because the word of God is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Amen. See, God was working to the good. Now, I can tell you, God did not want that young man to do that, to perish. But he kept making choices, bitterness and anger and hatred. He, there was no peace in his life that cost him everything. Amen. We don't want to live like that. Amen. We want to live in the peace of God. Amen. We want to be the children of God that understand that God is working to the good. This morning, God is working to the good. Whatever you're going through in your life, wherever your situation is in your life, whatever you're facing in your life, I'm telling you, all of heaven is positioned for you. And that if you position yourself to allow God by trusting in Him, by yielding your spirit, by being led by the spirit, then God can work in and through your life. And he can take your hopes and your dreams and bring them to reality, amen? Yes. For some of you, I'm telling you, the challenges are daunting. It seems like tomorrow, all hell is gonna break loose. But I'm here to tell you that God's in control. Yes. God's got his hand on your life. 
that you are valuable to him. You are worth You have great worth to him. That's the kind of God we serve.